can welcome friends. We are so grateful you're all here this morning. Especially we're grateful because of the many gifts that you will bring to not only our conversation, but discovering ways of putting our faith into action. You know, it's all about how we continue to move more deeply into our baptismal ministry. So um, we really look forward to our next steps and our guests. Well, this morning, as many of you know, the Stevenson School for Ministry is in much wonderful transition. And so we're delighted to welcome our new interim associate dean, Dr. Colin Cornell. Some of you have had uh, Colin as a faculty. He teaches you know, our Hebrew Testament, as well as Hebrew, as well as many other creative modules and courses. But now with Michael's retirement, December 31st, uh, Colin is our new associate dean. It's absolutely been a miracle. He said, yes, I'm so happy um, because he will be supportive of all of you in the same ways that um, Michael in the same role right now. Um, and so uh, please welcome uh, Colin and know that he will be our tech support this morning, our super duper tech support, which we always need. I am also really, really uh, delighted to welcome our new dean. And while that may seem odd to you, yes, I retired, but January is our tr transition time. And our new dean, Sarah Stonecipher, Boylan is with us this morning for a short time. She has another commitment, but I'm so glad she's with us this morning. She comes to us with so much experience. She's a digital missioner. She was the manager of operations at the Center of Lifelong Learning at Virginia Theological Seminary, which is always just the best. She has authored and done podcasts and all kinds of cool things and has been a uh, technology consultant in so many ways. And so I could not be happier. And during this time of transition, I've gotten to know Sarah and work with Colin in a new way. And I just want to say, wow, we are in for amazing things ahead. Um, it is a miracle from God. And, you know, just as you all are in the process of becoming, so is SSFM on its own journey. So on to our program for this morning. Well, we are delighted to welcome back Carla Christopher Wilson, who comes to us she is um, on the Synod staff of the Lower Susquehanna right. Synod. Uh, it brings our Lutheran uh, friends uh, along also. Uh, Carla is so gifted in so many ways, um, and we are looking forward to um, her wisdom with us this morning, especially as we continue to engage in the depths of our conversations of racial justice. God's justice in our world. And Kevin Barron, we are so delighted that you are with us. Kevin has recently been called as halftime rector to St. Luke's Altoona. Yay, Kevin, as many of you know, Kevin is a graduate of the Stevenson School for Ministry. And we are just always so delighted to see what all emerges from Kevin's journey and his path and his wisdom will uh, be with us this morning. So the invitation is to listen, to be in relationship, and to live this time together in the spirit of advocacy. And with that, I'm going to turn our prayers. We are good Episcopalians, well, and Lutherans, and everybody else that's here. And so we begin with our prayers. And... Uh, I've asked Colin as our new associate dean if he would lead us in those prayers. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. You who by the leading of a star guided the Magi to the brightness of the holy child of Bethlehem, lead us to the light of revelation that we may value and honor the very gifts of our sisters and brothers. Christ, be our light. Shine Amen. in our hearts. You who framed the brightness of the first light in creation, dispel the arrogance, animosity, and anger that shatter the unity of your holy church. 
fill your faithful people with the radiant light of truth. Christ, be our light. Shine, Shine in our hearts. You who delivered your people from the misery of bondage and slavery to the land of promise, set us free from enslavement to division, disunity, and distrust in our public life and labor. Illumine those in authority with the light of vision. Christ, be our light. Shine, shine in our in hearts. Heart. You who shower comfort and hope to the lowest, the lost, and the least, shower the light of compassion on the sick, the sorrowful, and the suffering. Help us to be your compassion and hope in the world. Christ, be our light. Shine, shine in our in hearts. In your heart. May Christ, the morning star who knows no setting, find us ever burning with the light of love, the spirit of truth, and the wellspring of hope. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who reached across the ethnic boundaries between Samaritan, Roman, and Jew, who offered fresh sight to the blind and freedom to captives, help us break down the barriers in our community. Enable us to see the reality of racism and bigotry and free us to challenge and uproot it. God of mercy, we pray for all in any need of tr uh, uh, any kind of need or trouble, for those whose lives are closely linked with ours and those connected to us as part of the human family, for refugees and prisoners, for the sick and suffering, the lonely and despairing, for those facing violence, for all held down by prejudice or injustice, awaken in us compassion and humility of spirit as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. God of mercy, hear our, our prayers, prayers for all, for all who are in need. in need. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be with you once again and to see a lot of familiar faces. It's, uh, it's always a joy uh, to, to see you all. Um, can, I, uh, can I get a volunteer uh, to, uh, to read our scriptural passage for today? Uh, of course, we are reading a scripture passage that is quite familiar uh, to us all, uh, but, um, uh, uh, but uh, we'll go ahead and read it. Uh, Jim, I think I saw your hand. Thank you. Reading from Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Oh, uh, go ahead and continue, uh, Jim. Sorry. That's all right. 
Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Thank you, Jim. Our scripture passage today opens with the arrival of three strangers in Jerusalem during the reign of King Herod. They are Zoroastrian astrologers uh, who have traveled from the east. Their visit to Jerusalem draws considerable attention and causes a great deal of disruption as they recount that they have been following a comet that would lead them to a newly born king of the Jews. This king would be found in the land over which the comet stopped. Their claim was further strengthened as they came bearing gifts for the newly born king and not for Herod, the current king. In the Greco-Roman world, kings were the highest of humans and the lowest of the gods. Therefore, the Magi brought gifts appropriate for a king consistent with their beliefs. News of this disturbance reaches Herod and he and the people have cause for alarm as the appearance of a comet commonly meant political upheaval. They undoubtedly recognized the political upheaval that would be caused by the introduction of a rival to King Herod. For Herod, the news of a newly born king meant the arrival of the Messiah. He calls together the chief priests and scribes inquiring of them where the Messiah was to be born. His fear is intensified as they recount the words of the prophet Micah, identifying the birthplace as Bethlehem, the city in which King David was born. Although Herod may not have known the prophecy concerning the arrival of the Messiah, since he needed to ask the chief priests and scribes, he did recognize the threat to his own power. Herod was installed in the seat of power by Rome, whereas in the eyes of the people, the Messiah, who bore the lineage of King David, would be installed by God himself, in contrast to Herod's illegitimate and worldly installation. If Herod were to retain his power and riches, he needed to eliminate this newly born rival. He was, a, he, was he was tyrannical and cruel and would do whatever it took to retain his power. He murdered quite a number of people for political reasons, including his son and other relatives. So there was no line he feared crossing to address his political threats. So he secretly calls the astrologists to learn more about what they knew about the location and particulars about the child. He inquires of the exact time the comet appeared. Learning the exact time of the star's appearance would be an integral astrological piece of information, as it would enable Herod to determine the age of the child. This was a dangerous moment, perhaps known or unknown, to the astrologers. If they told him all he needed to know to find the child, they would be of no further use to him. As they were secretly brought to him, nobody knew they were there. He could have destroyed the evidence they represented by murdering them and discreetly sending assassins to murder the child. However, such a move might implicate him directly. The visitors couldn't just disappear without question. He chose instead to send them to Bethlehem to find the child and to return to him confirming his location with the, with the ruse that he himself would go to worship the child. Herod then likely sent assassins following them at a distance, at a discreet distance, uh, to murder the child and the astrologers far from the city. The people might just assume that they never found the child. In that way, he would not be directly implicated in the murder. The astrologers traveled to Bethlehem and find the child. They bestow gifts upon him and are warned in a dream to return to their country by an alternate route. Likewise, Joseph is warned in a dream that Herod seeks to kill the child. 
In the middle of the night, he takes his young family to Egypt. Herod then learns that his plans have been thwarted. Although he has not received concrete confirmation of where exactly to find the child, he acts on the information he does possess. Knowing from the, from the astrologers that they saw the comet two years before, Herod orders the death of all children two years of age and younger. Civil disobedience is defined as nonviolently refusing to obey the demands or commands of the occupying power with the goal of bringing about social change. By not returning to Herod to confirm the location of the child, the astrologers practiced civil disobedience. They enabled a messiah to remain in the world. However, this act of civil disobedience is really the culmination of their actions. Their act of civil disobedience really begins immediately upon entering Jerusalem, as they speak truth to power and ask the dangerous question of where to find the newly born and legitimate king. They stand in the face of danger as they take an audience with Herod, who assures them that they have nothing to fear from him as long as they work as his investigators. Most importantly, they are guided by their faith in the child. They make the active choice to choose the king of peace rather than the tyrannical king of the world. So, Carla, my intrepid traveler in this journey. <laughs> oh, good morning, everybody. And so as we talk about the Magi and the Epiphany journey, it has always been one of my favorite parts of this story that this is really our first um, dramatic New Testament version of direct and active resistance, right? We're seeing the order of someone who is in power. We see a direct order that has to do with preserving power, preserving control. And they give this direct order to other individuals who have power and influence. There's, this is a jockeying between different political systems, ambassadors, um, a preservation of power through alliance. And then there is a moral choice based on the ambassadors, the representatives, right? Because that's what the Magi are. They're almost, if, if we're trying to equate it to a political system, they are the representatives chosen from what was likely a large school, um, large conclaves of thoughtful reflection. You know, we're coming from um, courts, you know, where, where does an astrologer work? Probably not in, you know, a, a tiny castle tower, right? We're looking at someone who is part of a royal court, who is part of a school, who's part of a library, who's part of an academic and religious and politically funded system, and who is going to undertake traveling to gather information and carry it back along with opinions and assessments, publish some papers in well-respected journals, shape public policy, and share with other individuals um, what are the recommendations for best practices to move forward. So to make the decision to not honor the local leader, to choose an alternate route, they are making an active judgment about whether this political decision um, is coming from someone worthy of respect, is coming from someone with um, a morality that aligns with theirs and the groups they represent because they know that they do not act alone and is making a decision with a long-term impact that is in alignment with the long-term impact the Magi feel called to have on their professions, their communities, and their own long-term work. So there is a multifaceted evaluation. How does this reflect on the long-term goals and work of my community? How does this decision reflect on the long-term goals and priorities of my 
personal intimate community and place that I am doing the work that I'm called to do? And what does my heart, my head, and my gut tell me about the rightness of this thing that I'm being called to follow? And after running through these three vettings, right, the Magi came to the decision that this was not a leader who was in alignment with their community-based work, with their personal ethos, or with their scientific and global professional um, desires and the code of ethics that they had ascribed to as being part of this work. And so they made the decision that leaders come and go, but the calling is eternal. And that at times there will be choices that need to be made. And so they made those choices, but they did not make them um, without careful intention and without careful thought process around execution. So they knew what they were trying to do, and they were also very particular about how they did it. Did they go in and burn down Herod's palace? No. And that was certainly a choice they could have tried to make, but they were like, you know what, number-wise, we don't really got that. Strength-wise, we're probably nerdy intellectuals um, living out of backpacks. So maybe that's not, maybe taking on an army is not what we're called and equipped to do at this time. We are highly intelligent and strategic, and we speak multiple languages and have a pass as scientists and artists and mystics that we can go through other land without igniting um, a political challenge, right? There's a freedom for travel and movement in, in ancient worlds and countries that these individuals could have traveled with more safety, it's likely. And so they said going home an alternate route, sharing this news and developing a long-term strategy to respond to this is probably the best way given our gifts, talents, and, uh, and resources at this time. This helps us towards our long-term goal. And uh, that results-oriented thinking, that get done what you need to get done, is no small aspect of what constitutes uh, healthy and effective nonviolent resistance. And of course, our poster child of faith-based nonviolent resistance has a holiday and a birthday that is going to be celebrated in just a few days, which is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And the King Center continues his work today, staffed by many of his family, his children, and his uh, compatriots who are still here doing the work in this field. And I know that Colin has a fabulous slide that is available for some um, of the very basics that I want to introduce you to. Nonviolent resistance is a field, right? There, is, there are people that study this and that are experts um, around faith-based community organizing, um, particularly focusing on nonviolence. Why do we focus on nonviolence? I mean, isn't the Old Testament full of violent resistance? Isn't that, you know, even if you're a small group, God will give you a trumpet and a sword and you will take walls down and level armies five times your size? Absolutely. However, one, this is not 300 and it often does not work that way. Um, but two, that this is part of the Jesus paradigm, that we see wonderful Old Testament examples of geographic related triumph, which often just involves the military guided takeover of land, because that is how wealth was defined, that is how relevance was defined, that was how um, the, the generational gift and promise was defined. And so to reinforce the early prophecies of the Old Testament, it was necessary to discuss that in terms of land. But with Jesus and with the New Testament, we see a shift in the promise. The promise now is not related to earthly land, it's related to heavenly real estate. The promise is not related 
to dying in a way that honors God and dying in a way that passes wealth and opportunity onto your children, it's about eternal life. And we see Jesus perhaps tossing a table or two, but we have zero examples of Jesus throwing hands. Um, and for those who are less familiar with that particular vernacular, we do not see examples of Jesus using physical or militaristic violence as a way of problem solving, a way of increasing the kingdom. We see Jesus over and over again practicing care, acceptance, forgiveness, and love, even against individuals who are practicing violence against him. So this is a significant transition from um, the morals of the time, which is exactly why it's countercultural and gathers attention. Now, I don't think anyone would argue that right now we are in a highly militarized time. Politically, violence is used, land is used to indicate power, colonization and its effects are things that we have are still invested in, we're still profiting from, and we're still practicing in different areas of the world. Um, for any of us to think slavery doesn't still exist, of course it does. Um, it's the reasons why we have chips in our cell phones and diamonds in our wedding rings. Um, but now we say it's conflict. We don't call it um, purchasing uh, enslaved refugees from genocidal wars. Uh, you know, it's the same stuff, though. It's, it's anciently biblical. Um, so the countercultural response is the same things that Jesus did, is refusing to define wealth and refusing to define power and refusing to define legacy as land gain through violence. It is about eternal life and heavenly promise, um, practicing the salvation, uh, salvation recognizing forgiveness and grace that defines the beautiful kingdom, which I believe many of you are familiar with or have heard once or twice a mention of that beautiful community. And so the King Center has a few principles of what does nonviolent uh, resistance look like. And I think that's what I shared on the slide. It is four simple points. And um, I, I think they're coming up shortly. Dun, dun, dun. Feel the excitement. <laughs> um, but that the King Center, you know, they do speak a great deal about what are different types of nonviolent resistance. Um, boycotting is certainly one of them. But, you know, just out of curiosity and, you know, feel free to use the chat or speak out, what are some of the forms of nonviolent resistance that you are familiar with beyond boycotting? Oh, uh, yes. Occupation, the, the sitting in and simply stopping the status quo, business as usual, that if we make it that we are able to just sit in, and we've even seen very dramatic die-ins um, on the news lately. We've seen, uh, you know, that, that if we simply stop a large public visual area and say, you need to recognize that we are here, that this is the, the size of this impact. Um, artistic demonstrations, um, group sing and, you know, group dance, flash mob dances and movement. Um, art and music and culture have been part of every single sustained resistance in uh, a people's history. Because music and art and movement does so much to inspire. It does so much to record the history. It does so much to um, make things available uh, and accessible and memorable. Um, that is absolutely uh, huge 
messaging through social media, um, absolutely true. You know, raising awareness, teaching and education are a key part of nonviolent action. Um, simply just using our actions. I love it, divesting, choosing what we are not going to be involved in, removing con contribution of our resources. So, you know, please, by all means, cut and paste and save this list. Um, because what you have in the chat right here is wonderful examples of how we can make significant change. And this graphic in front of us is part of what is called the PICO model. And this is one that is, it was uh, copyrighted by Faith in Action, which is the primary uh, model that is used by national faith-based organizations right now. But it is also um, based on Dr. King's strategy of how do we practically do this. So this is your, this is your super practical uh, version of how, we're, how we faith-based organize in today's world. Um, the beginning is to do the research, right? And it is, it is cyclical because it is ongoing. But um, if you happen to know what research uh, you need to do, if you know, wow, I am horrified. What hit my heart is these, the images of these kids in cages. It's awful. Um, well, why are they there? Where are they actually from? Um, who has the power to do something about the situation? Who do you need to be talking to and reaching out to? Um, rather than succumbing to helplessness because of the overwhelm of the problem, is there a particular agency already doing the work? Is it happening in an area of the community that you have access to, right? Narrow it down until it can become about a specific action. And the only way you can narrow down to a specific action that you can do is through research. Choose your issue. It's not that the world is on fire. It's, well, what are the things about the world being on fire that particularly bother me, that I'm particularly drawn to, that I might particularly have skills to help? How can I research and learn more about what's actually going on? Who are the stakeholders and the power holders? And how can I work with them to move forward and figure out possible actions and then solutions? Continue to narrow down that issue, focus in through analysis and decide upon actions all the while figuring out who are both the power holders, um, who you're going to need to work with because they're the people that have the ability to make decisions and enforce change, and also working with the stakeholders, right? So power holders and stakeholders are two different types of people. The stakeholders are the ones that are involved. So work with the power holders and work with the stakeholders, and then develop what is called the action right? That becomes what is the choice? What is the, the action from our, our list, our library of nonviolence that's going to possibly be able to either raise awareness, um, make change, you know, advocate for a particular and specific change, maybe a change in legislation, a change in policy or practice, right? And then as we seek that action, we're going to continue the process. And this is the part that is so often skipped. So if you're taking notes, write this down, sugars. One-on-ones where we connect with the individuals that are actually affected by whatever challenge it is that we are addressing. This is so often a space that is skipped by the church because we think we have all the answers already. We know what Jesus did. We know what we think and what we feel based on our interpretation of the Bible. We know exactly what our social statements or our particular beliefs say. So we are good to go with what's right and wrong. The challenge is every culture and every era, of course, interprets the Bible differently. And loving your neighbor, caring for your neighbor may look very different in the neighbor's eyes than it does in our own. And so it is vital that before we say, we're going to shut down this factory because they're not paying 
equitable wages and they're taking advantage of folks and they're not keeping them safe. And then the people who actually work in the factory are like, wait, but where are we going to work? <laughs> we didn't ask you to shut that factory down. Um, we need them to change the wage structure or maybe we need uh, different supervisors. Maybe we're willing to work for lower wages because that's better for taxes, but we want more food pantries in town. We want better transportation so we don't have to have cars. Like maybe there's other things that we need that would help make this situation tenable for us. So every step of the way during creating public actions, it is vital, absolutely vital, that you remain in constant contact with those who are involved. And those one-on-ones um, are an important way of doing that. So what's the difference between a one-on-one -on -one and a relationship or a conversation? Um, aren't we just called to be in relationship? We're called to worship together, pray for each other. Absolutely. Um, we, you know, Jesus's example was often eating together, social time, you know, prayer together, and then, you know, possibly shared napping space. Excellent, excellent ways of building community. However, a one-on-one -on -one is a specific political term that involves an intentional focused conversation about the sharing of information related to a shared goal. Write down your questions ahead of time, take notes, practice as much transparency as possible, and walk into the conversation knowing the information you need, and then when you're done, walk away from it. Um, because it is far too easy for conversations to go afield, and then you get lots more information, and it can often derail you as, you know, the people of Christ are often chatty folks. And we want to respect people's time. We want them to understand that this is a professional conversation focused on goal-oriented work. And we're going to try to have lots of these, right? So what we want is information that if we need to, we could turn it into a report. We could even pull statistics out of it. We can say, I talked to 20 leaders in the community and 18 of them said their primary concern with this factory is that they need better transportation to get there. Right. So you've got to think about this is not just about building trust and relationship with this person. This is about getting a better understanding of the wider community they represent. And so you're looking to ask the same questions or approximately the same questions of multiple people so that you can check in and vet the work that you're doing and make sure that it is in alignment with the needs and desires of the community that you're seeking to partner with. So these one-on-one -on -one intentional conversations where you have the same discussion multiple times so that you can hear multiple people answer those same few prompts, um, it's very important to really be focused and know what you want to learn about um, before you go in. So that is, and I, I love what Wanda just put in the chat, that the idea of a one-on-one -on -one is really listening to understand. It's not about listening to give the response back. This is not pastoral care. This is not your opportunity to create a lifelong friend. This is about making someone feel truly heard and understood and that their, their problem, their challenge, um, their issue is something that you are here to uplift and support them in doing the work to to solve because it is about um, returning power to the individuals um, who are actually affected. And uh, Martin Luther King spoke frequently about direct action um, as something that was about just versus unjust laws to bring it back to the Magi. And his a quote of his that I love is a just and you know little gendered language here. Please forgive. Um, a just law is a man-made code that squares with moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with moral law. 
Now, one who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. And in Dr. King's mind, this was the render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, if you exist in society, if you do something that's against civil law, you absolutely may go to prison for it. You may experience things like Martin Luther King dealt with, you know, German shepherds and hoses. And Martin Luther King absolutely walked into every public action knowing that that was a possibility and believing that was valid. Um, because that was part of the society that he was in, and that was civic law to which he was subject in civic issues. But he also said that when we make the decision to practice civil disobedience or nonviolent protest, that it is something we are called to as a matter of faith, which is how we ended up with all those lovely letters from Paul where he was writing from prison, the same way that Martin Luther King wrote his, what I believe is his most compelling work, letters from a Birmingham jail. The difference between having your heart broken by consequences or not, by being discouraged, by choosing not to do work because you're afraid of the consequences, is whether or not you think thoughtfully about whether or not those consequences are worth it before you enter into action. And the Magi, Jesus, uh, most of the apostles, and Martin Luther King all carefully considered that their actions would bring about consequences, but they believed that was worth it because that was who they were called to be as people of faith. And so we, we would like to spend some time um, asking you to contemplate uh, some of your uh, understandings of these calls. And um, so the, the six steps that I'm going to go over very, very quickly um, for nonviolent social change, according to Dr. King, um, were that Dr. King's original six-step process involved that was later simplified into the PICO model was the idea of information gathering um, and education. This is that research phase, right? And then there's that personal commitment and the negotiation, um, which are part of that, you know, those one-on-ones. Um, that's really getting to know the individuals and finding out what's going on um, and being part of the community um, and setting your goals. But also some of that negotiation uh, is part of your research, right? That's as you're getting to know the legislators involved, the power holders involved, and then is taking that direct action. And part of the direct action Dr. King firmly believed was the act of reconciliation, healing justice, restorative justice, which we'll get to restorative justice a little later. But we did spend some time, if you attended one of our earlier uh, webinars uh, last year, we talked a lot about the principles of restorative justice as a field. And this is where that ties in that after direct action, you don't burn it down and walk away from the ashes. That isn't the Christ way, and it certainly wasn't Martin Luther King's way. And that got a lot of his people angry with him, right? There were both black folks and white folks that said, okay, you raised your point, now leave us to fix it. And Dr. King said, no, I'm actually going to stay and work with these people who were formerly those I was opposed to, who may have hated me. I'm going to be part of the process of healing and I'm willing to engage in long-term dialogue, political dialogue, um, being an advisor, I'm willing to stay part of this community. So if these six steps for nonviolent social change, and we'll type those in the chat so that you have easy access to them and can copy them, but um, which of these steps of nonviolent social change did the Magi take? And how did they play out in the Magi's nonviolence resist nonviolent resistance? Um, and then also that the Magi and Dr. King were both moved to their action not by their powerful political, um, 
you know, attachments, but by that heart, head, and gut, you know, their dreams, quite literally dreams and prophecy that spoke to them, right? If you notice in Dr. King's speeches, his biggest source of where he pulls references from is the book of Isaiah, my favorite as well. Um, poetic prophecy was the inspiration for most of Dr. King's vision for the beloved community. So um, discuss how the actions that they took altered the trajectory of their moments in time. But also, you know, if you end up having time, um, I would love to for you to incorporate into your conversation how that prophecy, how those actions, um, how those choices were inspired by the prophecy, the, the sacred truth telling, the art culture dream and revelation that simply spoke into their hearts and they changed the trajectory of their time based on an unexpected dream and prophecy movement in their hearts and, and what some of those might be for you. So whew, that was a lot. I didn't realize quite how meaty that was. I don't know, Kevin, do you think that, uh, that we can incorporate any of this stuff today? I mean, I've heard lots of people say that Dr. King was awesome for a time when people really were aware of listening to dreams and prophecies and were much more biblically educated and also were more oriented towards the government and the community. Like they understood the larger community, the wider world, their smaller intimate communities and themselves as individuals, but that now it's nothing but me, 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 and we couldn't carry sustained movements like this. I have heard many a person say that the age of advocacy and community action is dead. Do you think that people of faith could even possibly begin to resurrect any of this? Sure, I mean, you know, I, I think so, because the thing that always uh, is impressed upon me when you know when I read passages like this and when I look at uh, the work of Dr. King is the simplicity of the call. Uh, specifically, uh, one is not asked to do a very complex thing. Uh, one is basically asked to, as, as through the example of the factory that you gave, uh, uh, the, 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 the call may be as simple as uh, a living wage or transportation to the uh, to the place, um, and so that gives people of faith an opportunity to uh, to specifically see that you know you, you don't necessarily have to have a very lofty, uh, uh, well defined and well crafted uh, and complicated uh, uh, call to which you are responding. It's going to be just that simple. Uh, you know the Magi. I mean, you know they you know they they their message was consistent wherever they went. We saw the star, we followed the star, we're here to pay homage. And they didn't vary from that because it was simple. It wasn't complicated and it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, moved in that, in that way. The second thing I find too is that uh, people have a tendency to care about things once they are personally affected by them or once they know someone who's per 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 personally affected by them. So, so specifically, I always look at the opportunity that people of faith have of actually expanding those networks of individuals that they know to be able to talk with folks from different aspects, different prospects, and different uh, in different outlooks, uh, so that they can determine what is it that has or holds importance to them and to the people that they love. Uh, and so, uh, so I think it really boils down to making the uh, you know using that degree of, of it's about me, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but in, a, in a broader sense, now to basically say it may be about me, but if it's about me, it's about someone else as well. And who is that someone else that I can, that I can incorporate here? So, you know, as we have these discussions, I really wonder about, you know, spiritual practices have become such a huge issue in our own pandemic. Word. Where is prophecy affecting each of you? Where are you feeling inspired to move in this time of, of so much trauma that honestly most of us are struggling to leave the house? Pod 
and you can use either chat or just speak up. See, this is how the pandemic, the pandemic works, I tell you. Like, that's, that is absolutely my other question. Like, Kevin, how do we, how does one continue doing this work that when we're so overwhelmed, when we're so disheartened about the injustice and the suffering in the world, that it really does just feel too big? You know, we're just shut down. So I, I think it's the, it, it's, it's oftentimes forgetting that, uh, that there are so many things that happen within the world that affect us personally. Uh, the pandemic is a great example of these things, uh, that specifically, even though we ourselves may not have contracted COVID, uh, we know of people who have. Uh, we know that it, it has impacted the way we worship. It, it, it has impacted the way we work. And really, those things take their toll on an individual basis. Uh, and, and so really, for me, it's about keeping those spiritual practices in place, uh, because specifically that is an opportunity to really move beyond that, to beyond that space, uh, that space where things can become so very overwhelming. Uh, because of course there is power in prayer. Uh, you know, there is power in immersing yourself in the various practices, uh, spiritual practices that we have. And oftentimes we forget that. Uh, we get to the point where things become so overwhelming that we feel that we can't pray or that we can't uh, or that we can't do our practices. But one thing that we can do is we can sit silently and listen. And, uh, and I think that is one of the most effective tools I think any of us has uh, to specifically sit silently, listen to the voice of God speaking uh, and to uh, and to recharge after that. Yep, I will say the first time that I've ever been able to successfully meditate is during this pandemic, because I could never sit still that long before. And so I have finally hit the point where I can actually slow down and be still. And I have found that meditation, breathing exercises, um, simply co contemplating nature, looking at stars. Ooh. On that. yes. That's a thing now. Yeah, I mean, I get you out of your head. I mean, actually, it gets you out of that space where you're constantly uh, uh, engaging and re-engaging and re-engaging and re-engaging. Uh, you know, that voice that keeps you up in the middle of the night, you know, with those nagging things over and over and over and over again. It disrupts that pattern. It disrupts that ability uh, for those things to become so very, very overwhelming uh, and gives you a way of getting out of those things and moving out of those things. Because after time goes on and you're able to disrupt that pattern in, an, in, an, in enough of a way, then the pattern ceases to repeat itself once again. And you find that you're able to move out of that uh, in a very effective way. Two applications depending on what they're doing. So, okay, still the same oh, go ahead. Okay, I, I learned too that the meditation helps you discern because we can't all be Martin Luther King and we can't all be, uh, we can't fix everything either. And so when you take the time to spend time with God and meditate and, and ask him, okay, what do you want me to do? And you listen, I think that's helpful as well. Because I, I, you know, I, I always want to go in there and get all excited and be zealous and, 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 and do, and then, you know, save the world, you know, and you have to meditation and, and that helps you sit back and say, okay, I need to find out what God wants me to do, where I am and what I'm doing. And I thought that's what helped me a lot, even through the pandemic and, and, and every day. So we have an awesome video that just helps illustrate a little bit of these concepts. Colin, can you show that to before we go into small groups? Um, 
you know, just a, a time to say, we're going to contemplate these questions again, you know, just as a reminder to I reposted them so that they would be accessible towards the bottom of the screen. And so did Colin about those six steps for nonviolent social change and the PICO model and, um, you know, how did the Magi use those steps? And then also, how did the Magi and Dr. King, um, how were they both moved by dreams, by prophecy, by vision, by emotional experiences of what was happening around them and their gut response to something that just wasn't okay? And then how did they translate the, this doesn't feel right, this just don't feel right, it doesn't sit right in my spirit. How did they translate that into physical, practical actions that led to change in their communities and then on a much larger social scale? What was the trajectory for that? So Colin, if you would invite people into some, some four or five person groups, and then we're going to give y'all, let's see, we said, 10 30 so we're going to give y'all 30 minutes so it's 10 40 now so if y'all could come back at um at 10 oh we did say 40 minutes okay so if y'all would come back at 11 15 let's do that we'll keep us keep us on schedule welcome back my friends so what do you think Kevin should we should we do the check back before the break or should we, yeah, let's get them while they're fresh. I see Robin is affirming that. <laughs> so can we have um, folks, uh, someone from each group, just kind of share what the, the main points were that came up in your discussion? Don't all, all at once, you know, but, um, but please pop up. I, I see Barbara is ready to rock and roll. We are ready. So I don't remember our number. I think we were uh, group six, but a couple of things really came out that I think um, that might be important, or at least felt important to us to name. But one was um, the spiritual growth of the Magi during their journey. You know, that both that longing and that commitment to actually find uh, the importance to meet the reason the star rose, but the risk that developed as they went along. And so how that personal commitment is really important because we can have a longing and then when things get tough, we can choose not to do that, not to continue on the journey. And so that sense of longing and commitment and risk seemed really important. And the other part that I thought was marvelous was this idea that the wise men developed a different kind of wisdom. You know, so these were these wise, educated, powerful people, and they came with a certain amount of knowledge, but until they sort of humbled themselves to talk to the leaders of the Jewish tradition and then continue following, they developed a different kind of wisdom, a different a heart wisdom, a wisdom of listening to God, of altering their response based upon their interaction with the Christ child. So that shift in type of wisdom and how that can be a reconciliation like within yourself of when you combine both your head knowledge and your heart knowledge. Ooh. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I like that the, the, the head and heart knowledge coming together is just something that, that's resonating with me deeply. Who's willing to go next? I feel like I saw another hand, Hollis Ann. One of the best discussion groups I've ever been in. Uh, we started with telling a little bit of our own journey on justice path. And um, although it seemed like we were uh, not on the subject, um, Patrick called us back to uh, consider the Magi and the um, Pico. And so we, um, I was writing it down as we were talking. Uh, what they did um, was withdraw their resources from Herod, the Magi, um, which although Martin Luther King says, you know, if you have a problem with uh, the group you're in, you should stay and negotiate. Um, there would have been no negotiating with Herod. And by um, 
removing themselves. First of all, they negotiated among in their group. They went their separate ways, but they all agreed they weren't going back to Herod. So there was some negotiation in that group. Um, and they protected Jesus by not going back because perhaps they would have been under the threat of death or torture and might have given up the location. So they protected Jesus. Also, they funded the, the Holy Family with their gifts, which um, and one person said, yes, they funded the trip to Egypt. So um, in the dream, um, whether it was a daydream, uh, what I would call the visit from the Holy Spirit while I was discerning, um, they called it a dream and it may have been something they dreamt in their sleep or it may have been something they dreamt while they were awake. Um, they uh, did direct funding, withdrawal of resources from Herod. Uh, and some of us talked about situations we were in where we had to remove ourselves from um, a church or a group or a um, uh, inactive or adverse situation. And so they, they practice withdrawal of resources, which um, uh, we liken to um, the bus boycott where the people of the Birmingham, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the town, but um, Rosa Parks is credited with sort of inspiring it. Uh, I think it may be already underway, but in any case, the people who wanted to make a statement were able to change our country uh, and the direction it was headed by not showing up to use the transit system. And so those two things, I think uh, we saw as analogous. And that's my list. Wanda, I see you. And thank you, Hollis Ann. That's a heck of a list. <laughs> so we started at a, a little bit more of a holistic approach. And I just wanted to say thank you, Carla, because looking at the Magi as being nonviolent, socially resistant had not occurred to several of us in our group. Um, it just was new to me. I mean, truly that's what they were. Clearly that was their, their uh, take was, um, but I, I mean, I guess, you know, I, my white bubble, which I constantly try to pierce, it had, it just had never come up in anything I'd ever heard. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing, and wait, I only have two points on like Hollis. <laughs> um, the other thing we we talked about is, um, you know, that what they gave up, uh, you know, the kindest thing that really can be said about Herod in that era is that he was a despot. Um, he killed family members to stay in power. I mean, this this man was this man was not a nice neighbor. So just the very decision to go back home by a different route, which he would not know, um, they put their own personal safety on the line. Uh, just because he didn't know they were going to go a different way, he certainly had the resources to find them, to find that out, to do them great harm, including losing their life. And so I think that's we talked a bit about safety in, in this whole thing and, and how, you know, if I like to hold on to it. <laughs> you know, I think of the picture of John Lewis as a young man uh, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, with blood running down his face because somebody clubbed him in the head. Uh, that doesn't look like it was too horribly comfortable. So, um, you know, those sorts of things. So that that's a few things we talked about. <laughs> thank, thank you, Wanda. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, 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 I keyed in on um, the, um, shall we say, the cruelty of Herod as well. Uh, and in some instances, the cruelty was the point. And, uh, uh, and actually, thank you for, <laughs> for mentioning that, that oftentimes not necessarily uh, recognized aspect of this uh, despot. So, so who's next? Don't be shy. Don't make me call on people. Well, not that I know of people to call on anyway. But, um, <laughs> yes, Jim. <laughs> Okay, um, 
Yeah, we had a great group, uh, some, some good discussion. With regards to the six steps, we felt like um, they were probably all accomplished by the, the Magi. Um, they researched what was happening and went and met with Herod. They were already educated. They showed personal commitment. Um, with regards to negotiation, maybe negotiating amongst themselves, but I think uh, uh, there was also a suggestion that maybe there was some negotiation with God, uh, determining kind of what direction they should go, which I thought was really interesting. Um, as far as reconciliation goes, we don't know. Um, you know, another point that was made for reconciliation um, is that reconciliation happens, uh, I think Scott made the point again, that that both parties have to have the desire to reconcile in order for reconciliation to happen. So wouldn't have been any between the Magi and, um, and the wise men. Um, but they certainly took direct action. And, you know, I, um, I, I think um, Martha made the point that, you know, even though the wise men didn't have a, a lot of power to do things, this is kind of like the story of the, the child um, on the beach throwing um, star starfish back into the ocean and someone asks them, you know, there are so many starfish, what does it matter? And the child says, well, it matters to this one, you know, and mm -hmm. continues to do it. So it certainly mattered to Jesus and Jesus's family. And, um, and with regards to um, the other question, um, how the actions they took altered trajectory um, I think it was, um, Trayvon who, who made the comment that God's providence was showing what God wanted them to do with God's creation for God's manifestation. So certainly it, it changed the direction as far as the wise men and trajectory, trajectory, and of sort, of course, Martin Luther King, uh, did a lot to change the tra trajectory and. That's all I had to say. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, do we have, uh, is there, I think there, oh, that, there we go. Um, I lost count of the groups. Uh, Jennifer. Um, our group, first of all, we all, somebody else said that this was probably one of the best small, small group discussions they'd had, and we would agree with that in our group. And we came to the conclusion that as far as the six steps went, we felt that the Magi had really accomplished all of them except for reconciliation for much the same reason as Jim's group did, which is how do you reconcile with somebody who has no desire to do so? Um, where we thought the negotiation happened was negotiation with Herod. In other words, the fact that they were allowed to go to find the child may have been a negotiated agreement. So their personal commitment then becomes when they are told you need to go another way, when they realize that they need to go a different direction, the personal commitment is, okay, we're now going to make a commitment to break our negotiated deal. Mm. Which when you're breaking a negotiated deal with a ruler who is mm, paranoid at best, delusional at worst, and obviously cruel and violent, that's taking a huge personal risk to say, we know we told him we'd come back. We don't think that's a good idea and we're not going to do it, no matter what happens to us in the process. Um, and as far as how their actions altered the trajectory of their moment in time, if they had not gone another way, we would be looking at a very, very different world. Wow. You know, they would have led Herod right to Jesus. Wow. And heaven only knows what would have happened. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. And as far as Martin Luther King, one of the things that we talked about was his actions and his commitment to nonviolence combined with the fact that news coverage was changing from just photographs in newspapers to video images that you could see on your TV 
maybe not in real time, but certainly close to the event, brought up for some people a great big disconnect between what they were being told by people around them and what they were seeing in color on TV in front of them, which helped to bring a lot more awareness to what was going on. Wow. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Annie. Hey. <laughs> Gosh, you guys did such a good job of following directions and I'm going to take, I'm going to take the bullet for our group. We didn't talk about any of those things. Not the Magi, <laughs> none of the steps. We had a wide ranging conversation. Um, we talked about language. Uh, we talked about uh, using other people's language treating other people's language with as much respect as we treat the white, what's called business language. Um, and, and not requiring people to sound like, uh, like me, like a you know, white college educated, educated woman um, and being willing to make the effort to understand, um, because some, sometimes what you hear is, well, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, then work on it. Uh, there's more than one language. And how do you bring in cultures without appropriation? Um, and what is the role of uh, parishioners and churches are they to change policy or are they to minister to the individuals? And they think, I think, and anybody from my group is welcome to jump in here. Um, I think we decided that it was both. Um, certainly the wider church has a responsibility politically, but we do too. Um, school boards was mentioned, um, town councils. Um, I mentioned that we now have a community garden, which we didn't have before because people lobbied long enough uh, that we got it. Um, it, was, it was very interesting. It was, um, it was very culturally based, uh, our discussion and about relationships. Uh, there's a member of our group uh, whose parish serves a dinner uh, Thursday nights free and they have 200 people. And we talked and they're almost without exception, people from the community. And we talked about how that's wonderful and it will continue. We talked about how our churches are shrinking and but this, this ministry will continue regardless of the size of the church, which is pretty amazing. But we also talked about not just serving them, but sitting down and eating with them, which is very different. And knowing people by name, which is what was said earlier. Um, so I, I think, I think, uh, I can't read chats and talk at the same time. So I don't know whether anybody in my group has said something, but if I had to sum it up, I think we talked primarily about how to be relational and within relationships that just implies inclusivity. I think that's it. You have had a very, very fruitful conversation. Thank oh, you. it was wonderful. It was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and I learned about a new book. <laughs> <laughs> the, prayer, the prayer book, of, you know, of the Anglican communion. <laughs> ah, wonderful, wonderful. Actually, I love it. I love it. I love it. 
Um, have we, oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Ted, do us a favor and drop that title in the chat. Thank you. So um, are there any other groups left? Have we covered everyone? I'm gonna, you're extended over two screens here. So I wanna make sure I don't see any other hands. Okay, you get this well-promised break. <laughs> I just put a list of questions in the chat. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you could get, and if you need to take a minute to do this, that's absolutely fine. Get yourself something to write with. Open up a Word document or something, an email to yourself in your computer, or get yourself a piece of paper or a pen. Um, but we're gonna do a, a, a quick little exercise. So go and, go and grab something to write with. I'll give you a minute and then come on back. Okay, that's, that's kind of amazing. Okay, so I see that most of us have our, our things to write with. Um, so what I would love for you to start with doing is pick an issue, any issue that moves your heart, that occasionally keeps you up at night and just write it at the top of the page. And then work through these questions and share as you're going, you know, it'll be, it'll be mostly quiet for about five minutes, which is fine, but pop out and share and speak as you're writing and working through these questions. Let's do this together as an exercise. And maybe Kevin, would you mind doing yours out loud as you work through this? Sure will. Hmm. 
All right, uh, I think I will start. So the problem that uh, keeps me awake at night, um, sometimes most nights, is uh, voter suppression. Uh, and the concrete part of the problem where measurable change can be made within two years, with charitable process within three to six months, uh, really entails the passage of the uh, Fair Voting Act. Um, who is voter suppression affecting? Um, everyone, uh, but predominantly those who have least access to, uh, to credentials, to, uh, to polling places, uh, and the ability uh, to, uh, to cast their ballots in a fair and democratic method. Uh, this, of course, contain, this, of course, includes most notably those who are at the lower socioeconomic end of the spectrum, uh, which, of course, is um, primarily comprised of people of color, uh, people who have been um, uh, otherwise disenfranchised uh, within the system as well. Um, uh, the gatekeepers uh, into these spaces, um, I think, are our um, legislators, uh, are the people that we place in power, um, who are really um, in charge of keeping the guardrails up on this. Why is it happening? Um, a desire to remain in power. Uh, specifically, um, uh, we know that when people who have been, who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum and those who have the least, uh, when they turn out the vote, things change. Uh, we saw this, of course, with the, uh, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, prior to that, we saw this um, at the, um, during the reconstruction period, uh, just following the civil war. Uh, specifically a time when we, we will regain things such as uh, uh, not only the right to vote, but public education uh, for everyone and the ability to, to, uh, to have better lives and better existences. Um, who is benefiting uh, from this issue not being addressed? Uh, the powerful, uh, those who, um, uh, who actually have uh, um, the one percent of our population that control uh, the majority of the um, of the financial assets uh, of the uh, of the nation, and I dare say the world as well. Uh, it just doesn't stop with the United States, because of course the United States has uh, an influence on the uh, on the rest of the world. Okay, why has the affected community not been able to successfully address this issue? Um, Part and parcel of the problem, I think, is um, an inability to uh, believe that um, uh, that one voice matters, or that uh, uh, or that there is something that can be done by the individual. Particularly when one may feel as though all of these things are a done deal, and these things are are fixed in a way that uh, we don't have the opportunity to influence to influence them. So I think fear distrust and the, um, uh, and the sense of powerlessness um, uh, keeps the affected community from not being able to success, excess, successfully address the issue. Who has the power to fix it? We have the power to fix it. All of us have the power to fix it. Uh, when we realize that it addresses us all and impacts us all, uh, then we perhaps may get the opportunity to see that we do have the power to fix it and that we should. What do we specifically need for them to do? Uh, we need folks to call, call and communicate with their uh, elected representatives uh, at all levels uh, to let them know that, uh, uh, that the people are speaking and that, uh, uh, and that this is a problem that we do not want to, that we want to rectify, uh, that we want to, that we want to address and that we want to fix. Why should people of faith care? Uh, specifically, it's our, it's our call. Uh, you know, for those of us, I'll speak as Episcopalians, uh, for those of us who are Episcopalians, we renew our baptismal vows uh, at least once a year. Uh, and part of that baptismal covenant uh, speaks to the, um, uh, to the uh, speaks to upholding the dignity of everyone involved, uh, to, uh, to care for fair and effective treatment of all. Uh, as we prayed this morning in our colic, uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that we are addressing those who are the least among us, those who are, who are living in aspects of poverty, um, uh, degradation of, um, 
of, uh, of abject uh, misery. Uh, so we as people of faith, uh, uh, that's what we're called to do, uh, whether we are ordained as clergy or whether we are uh, uh, or whether we are a laity, we're all called to do this by nature of our baptism and by nature of our faith. So I've walked through my <laughs> little example there, hopefully um, uh, giving people the opportunity to, to see that, uh, uh, that it is not um, something that's overwhelming uh, uh, and daunting. Uh, any other voices out there? Um, uh, feel free to come off mute and let us know what you came up with. So let's see. Well, let's take a look at the chat here. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Dualistic thinking and polarization in society. Uh, tell us more about that, Jim. Sorry, I had to kind of take a minute to come off of mute. Um, well, to me, I mean, that's that's what really kind of um, tears me up a lot of the times. Um, seeing the anger and the resentment and the, you know, people have a need to um, to win, regardless of whether or not they're right. The disrespect for others, the disrespect for other people that might think differently, because uh, none of us, none of us are right all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're constantly, we are a work in progress, right? And we have to be respectful of that in ourselves and others. So, so dualistic thinking of, you know, being unwilling to see another person's viewpoint and be respectful of them and you know, uh, being unwilling to learn a different way or new thoughts, new ideas uh, is tragic. And uh, I think it has a, Pretty dramatic effect on the country, and, and it's has a lot of polarization in society and politics, of course. And uh, it's a far bigger thing than than I can dream to affect, probably. But uh, maybe in the little things that we do, we can, uh, and how we vote, we can have some small effect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dina, you mentioned the unsustainability of life for the working poor, uh, the, ability, the inability to live off the wages of so many jobs that are the most, that are the most readily available to many people. Uh, what is one, do you know, what one part, one concrete part of that problem where measure, where measurable change can be made within two years? I really struggle with answering that, Kevin, because um, I think it's such a big problem and has so many different factors to it. Um, it'd be easy to say that raising minimum wage or you know getting to the point where we offer a more viable level of that wage would certainly help, but I think that's kind of you know not enough to necessarily fill in that gap. So one thing that I often kind of wonder about is how to change the childcare system so that young, you know, when this affects either single parents or, you know, young or work families with young children, that they can afford to work and still pay childcare. Um, I returned to a teaching job for five months after being off for a year um, when our eldest was a year old. And so we had two parents with teaching jobs, which obviously pay far more than the kind of employment that I'm, you know, was troubling my soul so much. And it was completely unsustainable. Like what we had to pay for her childcare and all the other things that went into me, the both of us working, it actually, we were financially further ahead if I didn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's a teaching job with really good benefits and a much better salary than we're talking about in this situation. So I think trying to make some kind of improvement in how we offer childcare, the safety of it, how we pay for it, how it's just available to families in the situation that they can afford to, you know, leave their children safely and well and still get a job that manages to sustain some kind of life model is where I think we would have to consider it. 
Okay, good, good, good. So, so I'll ask the question to the um, to the group uh, at large as we as we continue with that thought process of the uh, of the problem of um, uh, of, of affordable house of affordable childcare. Um, why do we, why do we believe this is happening? Uh, that childcare is so unaffordable uh, at this uh, at this stage of the game in our in our constant uh, uh, in our in our societal uh, lives. <laughs> In, in current society. At the risk of being a diet in the wool capitalist, it's supply and demand. There's so much demand out there that you can get a great deal of money for keeping children. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I think Hollis Ann, you had your hand up first. I think... Oh uh, it goes back to what you were talking about, Kevin, um, the problem of voting rights versus voter suppression. Um, the concrete part of the problem that I, and I see it slightly different than you do, I see that it's a problem with the people who are elected and the people who are electing them now. I see that white supremacy has reared its ugly head again. And I think that if we could elect some different people in the next two years, I think we could see some change. The problem is it's a very vicious cycle if you have people who now cannot vote in their best interest because their vote is being suppressed through ever widening number uh, list of ways to suppress it. Um, that it's difficult, it's very difficult. Um, but three to six months, um, I think we could see a change in how much we challenge, how much we uh, advocate and put a counter pressure um, on the people who are refusing to let this come through because all these other problems that we have um, in racial injustice um, are affected by the fact that the people that are affected by it are being kept from voting. And- um, That's super real. I, super real. I wake up frequently worrying about this as being a, such a key issue that if we can't get this done, and also the ancillary to that is the change in funding, for candidates, um, their gatekeepers are the voters. We are the gatekeepers for this. And so um, the people in power, the people who are voting, they're, they're building their community, but they're only looking at the people who support them and keep them in power. And um, so they're sort of, in a way, pandering to this supremacy because there's no counter pressure. There's no balance and that's why I think these classes and this education and this advocacy is so important right now is that we just have to push back because the right now we saw an election where where black people for instance coming to vote made a huge difference and immediately um, the powers that be maneuvered to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, right. So we did a lot of pushing back and circling around with our our Magi and our our Dr. King. Um, yeah. And I, I thank all of you for sharing. This was an amazing practical exercise walkthrough. But I do want us to make sure that we have time for one more breakout. Um, there is a, a section of follow up questions that are that I placed in the chat. And those are the, the toolkit kind of, of well, how do we do this, right? Because that is the biggest question that I often get once we work through, okay, I've kind of identified a problem that has meaning to me. There's something that, I, that keeps me up at night. I know what that is. Um, and I've done the research, I've done the book studies, I've watched the specials. 
I've done my Googling, you know, I spoke, I sought out the webinars, right? I, I did the, at least the beginning of that ongoing journey of learning, but there is a huge challenge with making the leap from I'm learning about this issue, I'm educating myself around this issue, to I'm getting active on this issue. And that is often, and I say this with love and adoration of the church, where the church struggles to, to get it done, right? We can be a slower moving body. And because we are committed to bringing everyone along and we have those who are more resistant, um, we'll speak the less conflict causing route you know, there's less, there's less conflict in education and discussion than there is in action, because there must be a certain level of agreement for action and forward movement to happen. And it also often causes pushback because it's the action that triggers those consequences that we saw in our video, right? It's the action is what brought the consequences for Jesus, for Paul, right? The, the teaching was problematic and irritating. The discussion, you know, people didn't love Jesus hosting discussions, but it was when Jesus started encouraging social change, when Jesus physically went into places he wasn't supposed to be with, encouraged, um, actually talking to and empowering and offering faith community to enslaved people um, or to imprisoned people or to social outsiders, that that is where the consequences started coming and the fear of those consequences or the desire to not fracture what already feels like a small and fragile community often causes us to back down before taking these steps. So I wanted to give you a few examples. Now, many more of these you shared when we were talking about examples of nonviolent resistant or, or nonviolent action earlier on. But there's just a couple of them. There are the one-on-one -on -one conversations, but also petition gathering, um, going door to door, or canvassing is going around neighborhoods. You know, for example, you may not walk up to the door, but when we were starting youth ministry, we just filled a, a cooler with popsicles and ice cream sandwiches um, pre-COVID and walked out. And, and just went to parks, went to, to places where kids were playing basketball, right? And, and that became a place where we could make those connections. And maybe there was a note or a flyer or an invitation to summer school or to vacation Bible school that we gave out with the ice cream sandwiches, right? That's canvassing. Tabling is the way that's been most effective to connect with different cultural communities because cultural communities do tend to gather. So going to the Hispanic festival, going to the um, pride festival, going to the healthcare is a human right festival and having a table there where we gave out information and contact information, where we did interviews, where we asked for one-on-ones, where we got um, mailing lists or addresses. And that's a great way for churches, small groups, or congregations that want to connect with the community um, to do so. And uh, things like op-eds um, next to the obituaries, opinion editorials or letters to the editor are actually the most read part of um, a newspaper. So, and there are whole, you know, political individuals, that's their job is to check and track newspaper mentions, radio mentions, social media mentions. So even if you feel like those um, letters, those emails sent to legislators don't count, that is not true. They definitely do, um, as do opting out or boycotts, and then public actions and demonstrations, which often um, help raise awareness. They're, they're usually media attention grabs. So wh what I'd love for us to do, if Colin, if you could put us back in our groups again, just for 10 minutes, we're gonna take those 10 minutes for you to look at the thing that you wrote down, right? You each just did this with an issue that's close to your heart. What are just one to three actions 
that you could practically engage in over the next six months that might help move that needle just a hint the other way, right? And it doesn't have to be with Kevin's um, particular example, use your own that you were doing along with Kevin as he was doing his, right? What are, what are two or three actions that you could do for the thing that is passion filled for you? And we're gonna do this in our small group so that you can bounce ideas off each other. So go ahead and we're going to break out now and we'll come back at um, 1225. Okay, we'll see y'all at 1225. And, and start working on those now, you know, before you have your group to, to help you out, start looking at, just look at that list. What are two or three things that you could engage in? And I know, hashtag COVID, but, um, you know, so think about, you know, what's doable in this next six months. And then, you know, if we have a chance to get into our small groups, use that time to bounce those ideas off of each other. Are those working, Colin? Are we able to go back into our, our small groups? Yeah, they're working. Um, a few folks are still joining and maybe they they were away from their cameras so they didn't yet. Um, do oh, is it, that but, what it is? Yeah. Oh, okay. All good. All right, people's, people's brains haven't totally exploded. I'm quite proud of them. I am quite proud of our little folks. I'm, I'm convinced of something here. <clears throat> what are you convinced of? We need you to teach a module. Yes, <laughs> yes. And we need you to teach a module depending on your schedule, but I think it would work well if we did spring term B and take this group of people along with others that can't be here because what you just did was awesome. And and you too, Kevin, I mean, you're invited into this, but I know you're heavy into this. Have, as you're coming back this in the room, is being recorded. welcome back to the room. I have a request for you. There are two things that I would like you to do. The first one is those issues that keep you up at night. I want you to put them in the chat right now. What are the things that you are super passionate about that being a person of faith, you are super moved by the things that just catch you from the news, the newspapers, from sermons, from groups. Put in the chat what those things are. And then I want you to take three or four minutes and wait for everybody to be done with that. And then there is a function in the chat, if you're on a, a laptop or a tablet, where there are three little dots. And you can press those three dots and you will be given the option of saving the chat. And if you save that chat, what you will have then are the names of a bunch of individuals that are part of a community that you have registered membership in. And you can reach out and connect with those individuals. Because this is something, now we will be, we will be following up on these ideas. If you feel like your brain is exploding right now, um, please join us for our Lenten series where we will be continuing to move into the formation of beloved community through action um, and, and join us in uh, the second part of the spring semester in March for, for some faith-based community organizing resources. The Stevenson School of Ministry will not let you down, friends, but you have the opportunity to start this right now. 
And so that thing that we didn't get to talk about is the importance of accountability partners and supportive fellowship because Activist burnout is a class all on its own. How to be sustainable in action work. How to do faith-based organizing in a sustainable way because it is a very different type of self-care. It involves supportive network and community, the incorporation of arts, specific spiritual practices and disciplines. You cannot do this work long-term without it breaking your heart and sapping your spiritual energy unless you are intentional about how you do it. And one of the main things that's important is working with other individuals that have the same passion. So please use this community at Stevenson School for Ministry that you have access to and share your work, bounce ideas off of people that have similar or related passions. So um, as we wrap up today, um, any burning questions or insights from your group that you just really want to share with us before we close in prayer? What's, what's, um, what's burning? on your spirit right now. And especially if you haven't had a chance to share with us today and there's there's something you'd really like to share. Um, is there anyone that has a burning passion? I'm scrolling through here. Okay, you had all the answers of the world answered in your, uh, your groups. Oh, Evelyn, I see you. Was that you that was? I was trying to speak. I saw some movement, but then I lost it on my screen. Uh, I, I I don't know, <laughs> but okay. my okay. my is my one of the things that really worries me is the children that we have right now are becoming so depressed, so defeated, so introspective, and the rate of child suicide is becoming almost a pandemic of its own. And I'm looking at how are these children going to parent when it's their turn? Are they going to have the tools to raise their own children? That's very powerful. Now, Colin, there's a question in the chat about how people use the learning platform and Colin is already on it. Colin, y'all, we are blessed by the Lord in having Colin. So in your follow-up materials, you will get that information about how we can, can stay in contact with each other. But again, last shameless plug, you could always just come to the Lenten series. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> so I do want to respect all your time and your fabulous snow angel making Sunday afternoon that I'm sure you have planned. I'm so grateful to share this space with you this morning and so filled with hope for the future of the church. This right here, this is the faith community that I am willing to get up for on a Sunday morning because I wanna be a part of it. This group right here is how I know that no matter what happens to the craziness of the institutional church, the gospel of Christ will never be lost from this world. And so I thank you for walking and existing and traveling and being on this journey with me. You are, you are hope embodied. And, um, and I'm just grateful for this room of people. And, uh, and thank you to Robin and Colin and are just the wonderful people that are holding space for and supporting this work as a faith practice. Um, and my, my partner in crime, Kevin, you know, Kevin and I plan to keep causing trouble for y'all for many months to come. So, uh, so you know, stay ready, stay ready, folks. But um, for today, we will take our deep breath, roll it out. I know your shoulders, you, your shoulders are up like this. Let them down, let them down. <laughs> and um, Father Kevin, would you just give us a blessing to carry with us? as we go forward in this work in this world, that we can stay encouraged and intentional the same way that Martin Luther King sang in prison and the Magi 
continue to to travel and follow a star even beyond the cradle in Bethlehem um, because hope has guided these people and uh, hope will continue to guide us. So good luck following your star this week, my friends. Very happy to Reverend Carla. Since we are in Epiphany, I thought it appropriate that we end with our Epiphany blessings for the season. May, God, may Almighty God, who led the wise men by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light of the world, lead us also in our pilgrimage to find the Lord. May God, who sent the Holy Spirit to rest upon the only begotten at his baptism in the River Jordan, pour out that Spirit on us who have come to the waters of new birth. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform our lives and make glad our hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thanks all. Blessed Epiphany Bye. season, friends. Blessed Bye. Epiphany. Bye. Thank Bye. you.